Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Today we have a brand new set of great stories for you to enjoy. Subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. You want a friggin' booth? You got one. Two ladies walk into the restaurant I work at. I look at them and smile politely. Hey there, ladies. How you doing? They straight up ignore me, walk up to the host stand, finish whatever conversation they were having, and I stood there just looking at them. They look at me, annoyed, like I was just supposed to assume they had two people and one at a table, because people do come in a lot, waiting for other people. It happens a lot, so we never assume numbers. They very rudely ask for a table for two, so I bring them to one of the tables on the first level, still being very polite. No, this won't work. Bring us into that part of the dining room. The one woman demanded as she pointed to the second level of the dining room, so I walked them to a table on the second level. Uh, seriously? This is right in the middle of the walkway. Give us a booth. We want a booth. I smiled, holding back some attitude. We have a rotational order to follow, so each server gets the same number of tables, and we get bitched at when we don't, so that's why it's kinda inconvenient, but not usually that big of a deal. I look around and had one booth that was meant for six, but it was attached to a family of six, two adults and four very young, very loud kids, and another booth that was meant for just four. I see the kids jumping in the booth, yelling, throwing food. The one in the high chair had a mountain of mac and cheese piled up on the floor beneath them. The parents sat there, trying to ignore their kids, but keep getting pelted by little pieces of broccoli. I grabbed the menus off the table they refused, once again, and head towards the six-top booth. I sit them down and quickly say, there you go, enjoy, and walk away before they have a chance to say anything to oppose this. They asked the server to speak to a manager and complained that I was rude when I legit was extremely polite to these two ladies. My manager knew that they were just being ridiculous and dismissed it, thankfully. But it's crazy what people will do to try to get people they don't even know in trouble. On their way out, I was sure to say, take care, ladies, have a great day. They just rolled their eyes at me. And our next story. Fired? Are you sure? So my friend's father, since retired, was a mechanical engineer. He was around 55 when this happened and very experienced in his field. In fact, he had some skill sets that were close to unique to the extent that you might be able to replicate them, but at extreme cost. We're talking multiple people from multiple companies from multiple countries taking weeks if not months to get up to speed with specific projects to do the same things. He was also a no bullcrap kind of guy who did this job, did it well, but also pointed out problems and expected others to point out problems to him. He was extremely solution oriented and had no time for office politics or keeping a positive attitude at work. Basically your everyday grumpy older engineer who really knew his thing and always was ready to help if you asked, but not very forthcoming in team building exercises and so on. He also ran his own business on the side, doing minor projects and so on. As was required by his employer, he'd reported this and was sure to not cause any conflicts of interest so his employer knew and accepted this. He was considered a valuable employee and got several awards that he cared little for during his many years with this employer. By all accounts, they paid him well, respected his knowledge, and accommodated his style, and he returned the favor by working very hard and making sure to mentor younger and newly employed engineers to make them effective co-workers. Then his firm was acquired by a larger firm, and a new management team installed. Initially, everyone was promised that things would remain the same, but with the new management came a new office culture. The new management pressured for unpaid overtime, for a more American corporate culture with cheering and clapping and so on. He considered it extremely cringe and refused to participate. His status as a long-standing and knowledgeable employee kept him safe for some time before the new management realized that resistance to the new culture centered around him and started pressuring him to play along. When he did not, they turned increasingly hostile, realizing that he held a lot of soft power in the company having mentored a large percentage of the engineers and resistance to their leadership centering around him. They started ordering him to work overtime. He answered that he was on time with his projects and that if they had identified an emergency requiring overtime, they would have to bring it up with the union to negotiate the overtime and make sure it was an actual emergency. The contract with the union said no overtime unless in an emergency. 
They tried to force him to participate in the cheering and clapping by making it mandatory for him to attend and yelling at him to participate, and he did, but so unenthusiastically that the event turned even more cringe and people started laughing. The workday turned more and more hostile, and he knew that things would come to a head sooner or later. Being an experienced engineer and knowing how to document things, he already had his ducks in a row. Then it finally happened. They caught him answering an email for his side business on a work laptop, brought him in and fired him on the spot for theft of company resources. He sat at the conference table and looked the three managers in their eyes, one after the other, and asked, Are you sure you want to do this? They all said, Yes. Are you really sure you want to do this? He was escorted to his desk by security to leave his phone, his badge, and his computer at the desk, and then escorted out. Once out of the building, he phoned his union representative, who immediately canceled the firing, claiming there was no just cause, which meant that it would go to the labor board for arbitration. You see, the company had an IT policy that it was okay to use the company laptop for personal business, including a side business, as long as you were on a break and compliant with IT security protocols. And the company was aware of and had approved his side business. And he was on break. Of course, he had his declaration of a side business signed by his former manager and the IT policy available and sent both to the union representative. Then he called his lawyer and asked him to send the pre-prepared cease and desist on two patents he held, patents that were not that significant and nothing he could make any serious money out of since they were mostly for very specific things used by the solutions he designed and used at his employers, but still his that he'd brought with him into the employment and allowed the employer to use in exchange for a slightly higher pay, all duly documented in his contract, of course. Then he went home for some vacation and tending his side business. He was always a man to prepare that he had enough money saved up to last him for a good time to the extent that he considered retiring entirely. My friend said that he had two job offers from competitors who looked to sniping him for some time within the week, basically as soon as they learned he was available. He was gracious but declined, but offered them to consult with his side business now that he had the time, which they eagerly accepted at twice the hourly rate he'd made at his earlier employers. His colleagues started ringing the day after for advice since the projects he'd managed could not go on without him. He was perfectly polite, but denied any information and help, saying he had left everything he had with the management and to contact them as he was no longer employed there. Several clients that phoned his private number were told the same thing. Since his private number was not on a public registry, he suspected that both colleagues and clients spent some time and or money to find it. It took two weeks before a manager phoned him and asked things. He politely declined to answer, got yelled at, and replied with something like, I'm sorry, you must have mistaken me for someone who works for you, and hung up. This happened a few times, and the next week, HR phoned him and stated the firing had been a mistake and he was welcome back to his job. He again politely declined, saying that he awaited the labor board's decision. But until then, he was happy to consult for them at six times his hourly pay, after taxes and administrative costs, of course. After a few days of wrangling and trying to negotiate, they had to accept. Then he sprung the patent issue on them, forcing them to pay for those too. Less than two and a half weeks after being fired, he was back at his desk. After roughly three months, the firing came to the labor board. The employer stated that they believed they'd handled the issue correctly, but were still willing to offer my friend's father his position back in the interest of goodwill and reconciliation. My friend's father in the union simply stated that he was now employed elsewhere, his own company, and no longer available. The labor board ruled in my friend's father's and the union's favor, and he got the normal damages. Three months pay damage and 24 months pay severance package including pension and, of course, the lawyer costs of the union paid by the employer. According to my friend, her father continued to work there until he retired, working 20 hours or so per week and 10 to 15 hours for other companies, making a pretty penny, continuing to charge them three times what he charged their competitors as an a-hole tax. The managers were not fired, but they were moved into their own group apart from the rest of the department. When it came to bonus calculations and the costs of her father's consultancy fees and the costs of the labor board arbitration were budgeted there, meaning they were constantly over budget and thus ineligible for bonuses for several years, which was a decent percentage of the incentives at that company, making at least one of them quit. My friend also said her father usually met any management complaints, 
with a big crap-eating grin and a, what are you going to do, fire me? And our last story. Awesome old lady on the train. One day I was getting on the train and an old lady carrying a cane wanted to board too. A gentleman offered to help. Do you need a hand, ma'am? No, thank you. I don't even need this cane. She swings it around, but my husband insists I use it just in case. She then hops on the train. I end up in the same area as the old lady in two of the very few open seats. After a few stops, a Karen enters. She has the haircut, the clothes, and the attitude. By now, all the seats are filled, and there are already people standing around due to the lack of seats. Karen pushes through a few people, looks around, and loudly exclaims to no one in particular, Will nobody offer a lady their seat? Nobody responds. She then goes around complaining to a few random people sitting down that she needs to sit because she's been standing for over an hour. Oh, the whore. Try working retail and just needs to put her feet up on a full train. Okay. One person gets fed up and gives her a seat right across from the old lady from before. The Karen now has a seat but still no place to put her feet up. She complains to the person next to her and the little old lady that these trains are always so cramped and wouldn't it be good if people who didn't need seats just gave them up? The awesome old lady took this as her cue, made a point of standing up really slowly and carefully, grabbing her cane and clutching it tightly and said, You can have my seat. Your feet probably need it more. Then she walked away very slowly, leaning heavily on her cane and asking people to please step aside so she could fit through. Karen got many angry glares at this point. She called out to the old lady, You can just keep sitting there. I don't need it that badly. And the old lady replied, You just said that you really needed it, so take it, and walked into the next cabin. Karen couldn't see her anymore at this point, but from my seat, I could see the old lady stand up straight and pick up the cane, swinging it around again. I don't think many people saw it because everyone continued to glare at Karen until she got off at the next stop. The old lady really just wanted to teach Karen a lesson by complying and acting her age, making Karen look like a bee. She's been my hero ever since. Thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.